Okay, because I saw you started listening to Bridget this morning at 7.30, so <laughs> it's, uh, I hope you still have some energy left for the last two talks of the day, because I know the one after mine will be good. I'm not so sure about this one. Um, so uh, again, my name is Jeff Payne, a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Those of you who don't know the Bureau by now, I guess you've had several people from there talking today. Um, functions of the State Geological Survey, and it's also an organized research unit of UT Austin. Um, I have spent virtually my whole career at the Bureau. I started in 1982 with a master's degree in uh, geophysics and uh, went on to get a PhD after that. And um, most of my career has been spent doing coastal geology, geologic mapping, and it seems like the last part of it has been focused on geophysics and remote sensing, but it turns out that that's been the last 30 years. So it's kind of funny how the the, uh, your, your history sort of accordions over time. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the general topic of applications of remote sensing and uh, near-surface geophysics, um, largely from work that we've been doing at the Bureau over those last three decades. And um, we started kind of this informal uh, organization or group called the Near-Surface Observatory. And uh, kind of like you're taking a a, uh, a telescope and turning it toward the part of the planet that we care about the most, and that most of us anyway, and that's the surface and the near surface environment. So, kind of everything from, you know, this is within the realm of groundwater and mining and, and environmental issues, the, the uh, biologic part of the planet. So, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the methods that we use and some of the tools and instruments that we use and some of the applications of those things. So, uh, this slide right here uh, kind of gives an overview of all the different kinds of things that we we do at the NSO. We do uh, geologic mapping. This happens to be a LIDAR image of the uh, Guadalupe Delta in, in uh, San Antonio Bay. Um, here's a large airborne platform conducting a time domain EM survey over parts of West Texas looking for groundwater. This is a big salt a map view of a big saltwater plume heading toward the Red River up here. Uh, some of you might recognize this as part of the uh, Wink sinkhole in West Texas. Um, this is uh, the western side of Bolivar Peninsula um, on the, the Gulf Coast, just east northeast of Galveston, uh, talking about the, the topics of uh, storms and erosion that we've studied there. Uh, there's surface faulting that's uh, an issue that we've um, studied over time as well, so faults and subsidence. This happens to be uh, Matagorda Peninsula. Uh, down by the Colorado River. So geologic mapping, groundwater exploration, salinity studies, um, geologic hazards like sinkholes and, and uh, landslides and coastal erosion and, and uh, storm effects and faults and subsidence. So that's, that's kind of the, the range of things that we've done. Um, if you want to see our, our website, see what we've done, there's a little bit of information there at that, um, at that web address. And I don't know if you're getting the slides or not, but um, you can find it at the Bureau site pretty easily. So next. So this is a really big screen. Um, I'm not sure where I can stand. I'm going to fall off this, I know. So um, when you're doing a, a near-surface geophysics project, um, you only have so many physical properties that you can work with. And most of these things were, were kind of looking for a physical property that would be a proxy for something that we really want to know. You know, rarely do we want to know what the density of something is, but if density varies with something that we do care about, then it makes sense to go and, and measure the density. So here's a, a kind of a, a, a table uh, listing all the physical properties that we can measure, density, magnetic uh, susceptibility, radioactivity, electrical properties like conductivity or, or uh, dielectric permittivity, things like that. Um, wave propagation, this tends to be seismic methods, um, and heat capacity. So those are the properties that we can study. Uh, the methods that we use to study them are these here, gravity for density changes, magnetic field uh, methods for magnetic properties, uh, particle detection for most of the radioactive methods, um, Resistivity, EM, ground penetrating radar, radar, spontaneous potential, induced polarization, uh, magnetic resonance uh, soundings, all of these are in the electrical category. Uh, seismic reflection, seismic refraction, and surface wave studies are all within the wave propagation realm. And then measuring thermal properties for heat capacity. So 
So we have all these different methods that have been developed. Many of them were developed for the mining industry that were then appropriated into the environmental and engineering realm, uh, starting really back in the, the 60s and 70s. And then we have all sorts of different platforms that we can use to uh, make these measurements. Um, virtually every one of them you can make from a borehole with a tool that you would lower down the borehole. All of them you can measure from the ground, and most of them you can measure even from the air, including gravity and, and other things. The only ones that you can't are things that require ground contact, like resistivity and spontaneous potential and so forth, as well as um, the seismic methods, because you have to you know, measure the, the ground movement, moving and um, induce some seismic energy. So, so this is kind of what we have to work with. This is the, the near surface realm. Um, go ahead. Next slide. So uh, I think Roger was mentioning something kind of similar to this. Um, this is actually a textbook written by this guy. I got this picture from it. Anybody know what this is? Yeah, a dowsing stick. So this guy is in England, and he was a big uh, water witcher. And um, pretty believable um, technique. I guess so you'll find tons of people who really think water witching works with this stick basically pointing straight down where you need to drill for water. Uh, I became a little more skeptical though when this guy mentioned in his book <clears throat> that um, as he got older in his career he didn't actually have to use the dowsing rod. He could you know, drive past a field and project his mind out there and, and determine where to drill. And he's probably true. That I think he probably knows enough about where water is that he could really do that. But he wasn't using this to do it. But, but this is kind of the reputation that near-surface geophysics has among a lot of people, especially you know, consultants and others, who uh, the comment that you'll often hear when there's a, there's a problem to be uh, investigated somewhere is, let's go run some geophysics. And it's a black box, and you get squiggles and stuff out of it. So um, the reputation perhaps hasn't improved a whole lot uh, beyond this. So next slide. So um, these are the early days of the Near Surface Observatory at the Bureau, and there's actually one person here who's in this collage of photographs. It's this guy right here. Um, our first EM project was a salinity study on the Canadian River in uh, northeastern New Mexico and uh, the Panhandle of Texas. And this is uh, Art Novakian uh, holding an EM-34 coil as we're traversing the, uh, the bottom of the Canadian River looking for uh, places where salt water was flowing in. So that was our first uh, EM project back in 1992. Uh, we had a multi-year effort at the, uh, the Pantex plant, which if you're familiar with it, it's near um, Amarillo, and um, it's where we uh, disassemble and reassemble nuclear weapons. And one of the environmental issues there was um, groundwater migrating down into the Ogallala through uh, Playa Basin. So we were doing seismic studies uh, across the Playa Basins trying to determine what the structure of these things were. Were they you know, subsidence features or old sinkholes? And, and what was the potential for water to uh, migrate down from those things to the, to the Ogallala? So this is a, a, what they called an elastic wave generator, which was a seismic source. It's got a 300-pound a iron uh, anvil there with a big rubber band around it. So Bart Kelly here would use hydraulics to lift that thing to a certain height, and then it would go slamming down on a plate, and that was our seismic uh, source for reflection and refraction work. Of course, you know, old school surveying to set up shot points and all that. And, and uh, this was the seismograph in the back of the van with the roll along box, and that's what I looked like back in 1992. <laughs> And then uh, we moved into the airborne realm in 1996. Um, this is a frequency domain EM survey that we were doing in uh, the San Angelo area over an oil field. In this case, we were using uh, this instrument here to measure the conductivity of the ground and using the uh, magnetometer uh, towed above it to measure the magnetic field strength. And we were looking for wells, old oil and gas wells, that had been abandoned and were leaking salt water into the subsurface. So, so here's an example of how you would use uh, you know, magnetics to try and find well casings and use EM to find um, salinity from leaking wells and then combine the two and you know, know which, uh, which places to go investigate at the ground. So uh, next, um, did we two go by or not? We skipped one there? I guess we can't go back. <laughs> 
All right, so uh, we missed all the airborne or the ground-based instruments. Um, so we'll go on to the airborne ones. Uh, like I mentioned, here's a helicopter towed EM and conductivity device or magnetic field device. In this case, we're looking at a, um, a saltwater plume that um, was emanating from an old oil field near the, the Red River. Uh, this is a conduct, apparent conductivity image uh, created by this instrument right here. And this is an old oil field, a uh, Permian Basin oil field, or a, a Permian Age oil field up on the, the upland next to the, the Red River Valley. Um, they used to have these things called uh, uh, evaporation pits where produced water would be stuck in these pits and allowed to evaporate. Well, not a whole lot of it evaporated. Most of it infiltrated into the subsurface. And so these hot spots here are places where salt water infiltrated into the ground migrated downstream and then made this huge plume here out on a alluvial terrace of the Red River. The biggest uh, pulse of it was right here. And you can see there's a path where it goes straight out this way and into the bottom land of the Red River there. So this is something that was contributing to the saltwater load of the Red River. Uh, this is that Hatchell project. This is a magnetic field map, strength map, showing uh, probably an area that's about you know three miles by five miles, something like that. All of these little pimple marks on here, these are old well casings. And uh, here's pipelines and things like that. So these were the magnetic uh, field images that we used to locate where wells were. We'd combine that with information like this to find wells that might be leaking. Um, another area more in the remote sensing realm, this is an a, a, a airborne LIDAR system that we've uh, owned for about the last 10 years. And what's unique about it uh, a couple things. One is it fits in a small aircraft and um, has two different laser systems in it. One is a uh, red laser that we use to um, <clears throat> determine topography of the ground underneath, underneath us and produce topographic maps. And the other one is a, is a green laser that actually penetrates water of reasonable clarity. So with the same two sensors, we can fly an area where we're over water or over land and get kind of a seamless um, uh, surface map for the, the ground surface as well as the uh, water bottom surface. And it works to, to depths of you know five, six, 10 meters, depending on the clarity of the water. On the Gulf Coast, it doesn't work <laughs> past about five centimeters, but, but that's OK. <clears throat> so over here is one of the uh, digital elevation models that are derived from data that we collect with this. Uh, this is the same image I showed earlier that's the western part of Bolivar Peninsula. And the detail you can get here is down to like a quarter meter, depending on you know how many times you fly over something and what elevation you're flying. So you can get uh, some highly detailed um, uh, elevation maps produced in that, which are useful for almost every project that we do. Uh, next slide, please. So. This is how a geophysicist would see uh, applying geophysics to the near surface. And um, these are the steps you would go through to um, uh, design a survey for uh, determining something. We use that table that I showed you before to enumerate the physical properties that could serve as a proxy for something that you want to know. Like I said, it's rarely conductivity that you want to know. It's it's uh, you know the, the salt that's causing the conductivity or something like that. So we deal a lot in proxy properties. Um, then we design and conduct a field experiment to measure the properties of interest. So you know, you know what you're looking for and you design this experiment, which might be how, uh, how close the line spacing is, what depth you've optimized it for, whatever. Um, then you process and analyze the data in a manner that's consistent with the field experiment. And then, really important, you interpret the results in the context of the method that you used. So, so this part is what most geophysicists are really comfortable with. But this isn't where most projects that use geophysics go wrong. <laughs> so next slide. Um, they often go wrong here, where the person who's doing the geophysics doesn't understand the problem or the issue that they're trying to solve. And so. That's on you guys to make sure that when you say, let's run some geophysics, that the person who runs the geophysics for you understands fully what they're looking for, because they can't design a proper experiment or process it properly if they don't know that. And often, they don't. 
And then finally, at the end, you know, it's real easy for a geophysicist, and they're very comfortable producing a, an anomaly map or squiggly lines like you mentioned. You know, it's, here's a seismic section. They get really nervous when they have to interpret it because that's kind of where the liability comes in. It's like, yeah, I know there's an anomaly there. I'm certain of it. I don't know what it means. <laughs> and so you really have to push them and make sure that you work with them to make them translate those results into something that's useful for the application that you're, you're applying it to. So, so just make sure that that first and that last step actually happen uh, if you're either doing a geophysics survey or a remote sensing one for that matter, and, um, or having one done. So next. So I've taken that same table and I'm, I'm using one type of study as an example here of of uh, how you might evaluate these things. So hydrostratigraphy, I mean here kind of hydro, your standard hydrogeological project where you've got uh, groundwater, say, of varying salinity. So you've got groundwater quality issues and you might have uh, groundwater following certain geologic horizons like sands versus clay or something like that. So, so there are two things you kind of want to know there. You want to know the water stuff and you want to know the, the uh, lithology or the, the uh, sediment stuff. So here are all the properties again. Here are the methods. I've shown those to you before. So the two things that you need for a, a successful geophysical survey is you need to have a contrast in that property that you're going to measure, and it needs to be a detectable one, something above the, the noise floor. So, so for most uh, hydrogeological studies, um, there's usually a nice contrast in, in particle activity or radioactivity. There's usually a nice contrast, a uh, huge one sometimes, in uh, electrical properties. And then often one especially related to the lithologic part in the uh, wave propagation or the seismic properties. All the rest of them tend to be small or no. So now you've already limited your methods to three that might be applicable for this. And then you ask the question, well, is it detectable? And uh, you know, for most of these, it's not. For the ones that we mentioned, they probably are. And you know, some like uh, thermal capacity are not even applicable. So, so these, these three families of methods would make the cut to the, to the next level. Uh, next, please. So I thought what I'd do now is just show you a couple of reasonably in-depth examples of uh, a couple of re recent remote sensing and geophysics projects just to give you an idea of of how these things can be applied. So um, the first one was, uh, all of you probably remember Hurricane Harvey in 2017. It was a, a pretty big storm that struck the central Texas coast and then it hung around for a long time and uh, deluged uh, the Houston area with rainfall and all that. So it was a, it was a big deal. Um, this is what it looked like as it was uh, approaching the middle part of the Texas coast. And so on a project like this, um, if you've been to the Texas coast, you know we have beaches and dunes and all of those things that when you have storm surge and we have storm waves and winds, um, these things can change pretty rapidly. So uh, two methods come to mind that would be useful for studying change and impact of a storm. And one is LIDAR for doing topo topographic change and looking at erosion of the beach and all that stuff. And the other would be imagery. So. So those are the things that we, uh, we did within, started flying this area within days after the storm passed. We flew out of Austin, so didn't really have to, to um, mess with the, uh, the mess that was, was down there. But um, uh, so we flew airborne LIDAR and we flew imagery to try and help state agencies uh, figure out you know, what kind of damage there was, what the extent of that was, and, and where there might be public safety issues that they needed to deal with. So next slide. Um, so this is a, a photograph that our LIDAR operator took from the aircraft as we were doing the survey. This is the southern end of San Jose Island. This is Lydia Ann Channel here. Port Aransas is just across the Corpus Christi Ship Channel from, uh, from where we're looking here. And this is the area that was most impacted by uh, storm surge. Um, the storm surge kind of came in farther up the coast and then the southerly winds pushed it down the channel. So this whole part of uh, Lydia Ann Channel was submerged by um, storm tides. And these are barges that had been moored along Lydia Ann Channel that were broken free and then floated uh, this direction as the water was going back into the Gulf and kind of ran aground on these, um, these dune lines here. So next. 
Um, here are some nice uh, drainage features, again showing that the water that was uh, pushed back into the bays had to drain back to the, the gulf and the, the, uh, the main channels weren't enough, so it kind of eroded through these dune lines and, and uh, pushed all that water and sand back, back toward the Gulf of Mexico. And there's another one of those um, barges that, that ran aground. Next. So here's the uh, kind of a detail of the, the airborne LIDAR system that we, we use. There's the red LIDAR part that um, uh, is uh, coming out of here. That's for the topographic part. There's the green part that uh, comes out of here, and that's for the, for the water bottom. And then there's also a high resolution digital camera so we can do imagery and, and LIDAR at the same time. So it's a perfect system to use for, uh, for assessing uh, Hurricane Harvey damage. Next. So uh, this is a detailed LIDAR image taken probably four days after landfall, something like that. So uh, higher elevations are in red, lower elevations are in blue. Here's the Gulf of Mexico right here. Um, this is San Jose Island. So again, you can see the, the dune ridges here that have been breached by um, water flooding from the bay side and trying to get to the, the Gulf side. And then here's one of those uh, the barges that were um, uh, run aground against the dune. So next. Uh, this is the southern end of Matagorda Island. This is the northern end of San Jose. There's an old tidal inlet here called Cedar Bayou that, that uh, separates the two. This had closed naturally from longshore drift, but Harvey was uh, strong enough to actually reopen that, that pass. And so a few days after landfall, it was still open and some water was going back and forth. But Lots of uh, sediment was moved around in this area. So next. Um, so the principal benefits of immediate post-storm surveys like this were to assess the event impact on population, infrastructure, and environment, identify hazards to the public, and uh, establish a baseline to monitor how the uh, islands recover um, af naturally after an event like this. And, and an important point we made to the National Academies after this was that it's important that they should be staged from outside the impact area because there's lots of danger to life and limb in these areas and you're trying to rescue people and all that. So as important as this stuff is, it's not as important as uh, you know, saving people who were uh, impacted by the area so, or the event. Um, this is the Marine Science Institute. Uh, there was a, a drilling ship that was um, broken free from its mooring. It sort of was heading out the channel and there used to be a, a nice research pier here at the at the Marine Science Institute that was uh, impacted by that and a couple of tugs trying to pull it away. So next. Um, we sort of made this, uh, uh, this is the part about getting the information back to the people who need it uh, in a way that they can use it. So we would fly the surveys in the daytime and we'd bring the data back to Austin and then we would process it overnight. And we had a web viewer, an ArcGIS uh, web viewer so that uh, emergency response people could um, the next day go in here and, and zoom in on the area that they were interested in and see the digital elevation models from the LIDAR data as well as the high resolution imagery. And so we updated that you know, by the, the end of the, the day following flying. So trying to make it as, as a responsive as possible. Next. So another thing is, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, so I started at 4.15, I think I got all, all right, we're good. Um, who's heard of the Wink sinkholes? All right, these are kind of famous uh, sinkholes out in West Texas, near the town of uh, Wink and Kermit. Um, the only other thing that Wink is famous for beyond the sinkholes is Roy Orbison. Roy, Roy Orbison uh, grew up in, uh, in Wink. They also have a really good uh, six-man football team, but other than that, it's the sinkholes and, and not much else. Kermit was famous for the frog, but um, they used to have their water tower uh, decorated with a, a painting of Kermit the frog. So uh, these sinkholes are, well, let me show the map first. Um, there's a highway here that goes, uh, Wink is down here, Kermit's up there, and this is Texas 115 connecting the two. Back in 1980, a Wink Sink 1 collapsed right here near a big tank battery. 
And then in uh, 2002, much larger sinkhole, Wink Sink 2, collapsed. And these happened to be in an oil field that was discovered and developed from the 20s through the, the 60s, and there's probably even more development going on there. And unfortunately, in this area, most of the, uh, the wells were drilled through the Permian bedded salt to the resources below. And they weren't plugged all that well or sealed off, so relatively fresh water got into the bedded salt zone, dissolved the salt, and then eventually that cavern migrated toward the surface to create these, uh, these sinkholes. So there's uh, you know, tons of old wells in this area. So here's an area where the problem is ground motion and the problem is the potential for, for future collapse in an area like this. So, so one of the obvious methods that would come up would be either remote sensing or a, a, a remote sensing method that would allow you to establish how much ground motion vertically is occurring. So that could be LIDAR, radar interferometry, something like that. And then a method to help us determine where there might be um, uh, you know, density deficits in the subsurface where there's a cavern that might lead to collapse. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, we're using radar interferometry to produce a map like this, showing places where the ground is, is moving over uh, relatively short periods of time. And then we took a gravimeter out there once we found these places where ground was moving and collected uh, gravitational field strength information to try and find where there might be areas of deficit with the uh, future collapse. And then uh, beyond that, we've done uh, multiple uh, LIDAR surveys out there looking to establish uh, ground, you know, net ground motion between the dates of the survey. So next, please. So uh, this is a little bit of information about the sinkholes. Uh, Wink Sink 1, like I mentioned, formed in, uh, in early June of 1980. It's about you know, 100 meters across, something like that. Uh, the biggest threat to the public is this highway here. That's Texas 115. And if you, could, if you were closer, you could see there's a whole series of concentric fissures that go around this thing, much greater diameter than just the collapse area. There are even some that, that get toward the highway over here. So, um, you know, the TxDOT has uh, traffic cones there to kind of show where these things are. And they're in the process of, of moving this highway about a you know, kilometer to the west so that they don't have to deal with uh, potential collapse there. So this one happens to encircle a, um, the Hendrick number 10A well, which was drilled in 1928, ceased production in 1964, but clearly, you know, there was dissolution going on around that well, which led to the, the collapse there. Uh, Wink Sink 2, again, is a much bigger one, uh, probably twice as uh, the diameter of Wink Sink 1. Uh, it formed in 2002. Um, it uh, encircles a water supply well that was um, um, drilled in 1960. So hundreds of millions of gallons of water were produced from this well, and it uh, apparently provided a conduit for, um, for water to dissolve salt there as well. So both those um, um, were related to uh, well penetrations through the salt. So go ahead. So this was uh, the data that we got from uh, INSAR. Uh, these are satellite-based uh, AirSAR measurements uh, or uh, 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 synthetic aperture radar. Um, this is a comparison of two passes over the area that are 22 months apart. So this is looking at, at differences in distance to the satellite over that 22-month uh, period. So uh, most of the stuff that's in green or blue are areas where there is no detectable change. So one of the reasons for doing this, we could cover a large area and determine areas that we didn't have to worry about uh, any collapse. But the areas where you see these uh, nice rainbow patterns are areas where there is a fair amount of movement between the two. There's a, a big area around Wink Sink 1 that actually does extend over here to the highway. And then here's Wink Sink 2, so there's an area north of it, and then this big area right here. And one cycle through this color band is 12 centimeters. And so if you start here in the green and go this direction, there's one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, almost four cycles here. Uh, so you're talking about half a meter of, um, of downward movement over this, uh, underneath this road right here over that 22 month period. So this pretty much told us the areas that we needed to worry about, you know, these county roads here, uh, a little bit around that highway there. So that's where we went back and did uh, gravity work. So next. Um, 
So that was one way of looking at it from the uh, radar interferometry that was satellite-based. Um, we didn't collect that data ourselves. Um, but this is another way of looking at it. We flew airborne LIDAR surveys at high resolution over this whole area. Uh, we were able to find a digital elevation model for this area that was uh, constructed from uh, 1968 aerial imagery. It wasn't very high resolution. But we compared that to a digital elevation model from a 2013 survey. So we've got 45 years elapsed here between those two DEMs. And you can, of course, we had the collapse, uh, sudden collapse here, and sudden collapse here, which is a big change. But it's uh, shocking, really, to see how much um, subsidence there was in these areas. Like the, the peak would be here. That's almost 10 meters of uh, subsidence. That's kind of getting on the scale of the stuff that you see in the, the San Joaquin Valley that's so famous. So that's a lot of vertical ground motion over that time. We reflew this area in 2017, and sure enough, there's still you know, active um, deformation going on in this area. So in this four-year period, we had as much as uh, three meters of elevation loss, especially down here right at this intersection between those two county roads. And those two county roads are open, by the way, and uh, develop cracks and get repaved and all that. So it's uh, not the safest place to be, probably. So next. Um, so those are the, that's the uh, um, uh, remote sensing part of it. Um, much more labor intensive is the gravity survey to try and find density um, deficit. So this was a, a gravity survey we did in the area. Uh, that's the gravimeter right there. You have uh, stations that are spaced at 10 meters or 20 meters or something. And gravity is really sensitive to elevation change. So um, we had to use a GPS, differential GPS measurement system here so that we could very accurately establish the elevation where we took these measurements because you have to correct for that. So this is about the extent of the uh, safety precautions in the area. It's a caution, unstable ground. So um, I'm not sure that is very scary to, to most people, but uh, let's go on. So um, here's one of the areas. This is area three that uh, the roads, the, the intersection roads come along like this. Um, so here's a, a boundary around the area that the NSAR showed was going down relatively rapidly. Uh, these little line segments here are places where we mapped earth fissures at the surface. You can see those kind of uh, you know, concentrate around this boundary between areas that aren't moving and areas that are, which makes sense. And then taking out the uh, radar interferometry and just looking at the air photo, uh, the circles here are places where there are wells. Um, so plenty of wells in this area. Here's the uh, area surrounding the uh, rapidly uh, subsiding area. Here are all the little fissures mapped. And then behind that is this, um, the gravity anomaly. So there's not much of a gravity anomaly for the cooler colors, but it gets pretty big uh, at the warmer ones here. And, and notice that the big gravity anomaly is up here, and there's not much of one here, and this is the area that's subsiding so quickly. So the way we interpret this is that there's probably a, a mass deficit here that could be a cavern approaching the surface, but this area is not really moving very much. Uh, this one, it seems like the ground deformation is kind of keeping pace with uh, cavern formation. So this is actually where we might expect there to be a catastrophic collapse. So that, those are the kinds of results you can get from this. So let's move on. Um, that county road looks like this. Uh, these are those pressure cracks that are and fissures that are in that area that's subsiding so rapidly. You can see a dramatic drop in elevation here as you go into that rapidly subsiding area. And uh, you know, here are those uh, pressure cracks related to that subsidence. So it's, and there are people driving over this all the time. It's, it's incredible uh, with tanker trucks and all that. So next. So radar interferometry we used to detect and monitor recent ground movement. We focused uh, ground and subsurface investigations with the results. We used microgravity to detect uh, shallow mass deficits and potential for future movement. And then airborne LIDAR to get a, a longer term uh, estimate of uh, ground movement. So next. Uh, now just a couple of uh, uh, brief things about other work that we do. Um, lots of interesting places and important problems that you can study with methods like these. Uh, here's the Colorado River as it heads into the Gulf of Mexico. 
This is Matagorda Peninsula, you know, kind of west of Galveston, I guess. Um, I don't know if you can see it on this image or not, but there's a nice linear feature here that's marked with the, the arrows. That's a growth fault where um, this side of the fault is actively moving down and converting uh, wetlands to, to open water. Um, so here you've got a signal of ground motion and you've got potentially a fault. So the methods that come to mind for that would again be imagery and, and elevation change. And secondly, a way to image the subsurface and look at uh, straddle boundaries. So we did airborne LIDAR here. This is the result at the same scale as that. And sure enough, you can see a nice little scarp that uh, kind of lose here in the developed area, but it extends uh, all the way across there. And then we had a seismic line, a reflection seismic line that we uh, collected across it. And you can see all these uh, reflections from um, geologic boundaries in the shallow subsurface. Here's the fault right here. You can see all this disruption and straddle boundaries and rotation of blocks and all of that. So we can image uh, the direction that the fault takes um, uh, through that. So next. Um, lots of other interesting things to study. Um, I think I've heard people say that uh, there are no documented um, environmental uh, impact incidents related to hydraulic fracturing uh, anywhere. Uh, that's not true. Uh, this is one right here. Um, this is on um, the high plains of Texas, and um, there was a hydraulic fracturing uh, operation going on just upslope of this spot right here. While they were pressuring up the uh, hydraulic fracturing thing, there was an eruption of uh, drilling mud and all sorts of fluid that came out of, uh, out of the, this hole here. It went down into this um, creek and a big fish kill and all of that. But um, there, and this is also an area where there's the big Ogallala aquifer, right? So the worry was that they were fracking below the aquifer and they've clearly got uh, you know, hydraulic fracturing compounds here at the surface. So did it impact the Ogallala as it was coming up through it? And so what we did here, um, we knew the property that we were looking after was um, uh, salinity of water because produced water is, is fairly saline. So we used methods, the EM method, to try and find areas where uh, conductivity might be elevated, um, uh, marking where that had, had made its way to the surface. So there's that. Um, here's an image from a trip I took back in 2010 to uh, the Sichuan province of China. This is a little town called Baishuan. And this town is, is famous because um, the great magnitude uh, 8.0 Wenchuan earthquake, this is kind of the epicentral area of it, happened on May 12th of uh, 2008. There's a flagpole right here, which uh, marks the place of a old middle school. And um, see this uh, landscape or landslide scar on the, on the hill slope. Most of this area has really high relief and uh, most of the cities and towns are along the rivers that are between, you know, in the bottom of these valleys between the really steeply sloped walls. And when this earthquake struck, there were more than 10,000 landslides that were uh, you know, produced during the shaking. And one of them uh, covered this, this middle school right here during, during school hours. So they, they never excavated it. Um, it's just the whole town now is a memorial for, um, for uh, the earthquake victims. And there were probably 80,000 people who, uh, who died in that earthquake. But, but this is the kind of thing where geophysics and remote sensing could really help uh, establish risks. Um, you know, lots of these features are visible on airborne LIDAR, places where, where there have been old slides. Uh, you could do uh, geophysics across you know, some of these things to determine you know, thickness of landslide deposits or stiffness of material or whatever. So tons of opportunity there to use, use uh, geophysics and remote sensing to, to lessen the risk. Um, uh, even uh, we're not restricted to studies on Earth. We can go to other planets. Um, these are the famous spiral bands from Mars. And there was a lander that went there taking a geophysical equipment or a piece of uh, geophysical equipment with them. It was a time domain EM device that was planted to try and determine how thick these, these bands are. And then lots of uh, opportunity with uh, work in areas of the planet that are warming like uh, the permafrost areas and, and uh, lots of work we can do there. And I think that's my last example coming up. Next. 
So um, here's uh, some permafrost related work that we did on the north slope of Alaska near uh, Dead Horse. Um, lots of change going on in these areas. Again, it's something where you know, topography is a, is a big part of it. Um, there are all sorts of uh, glacial features like this thing here. Now, this is kind of what the terrain looks like and the north slope of Alaska. It's very flat and featureless, but you have these things that look like huge mountains. Uh, it turns out to be a you know, 100, 150 foot high uh, ice volcano called a Pingo. Um, you can survey those pretty regular or, uh, readily with um, airborne instruments. So here's a digital elevation model of that Pingo with um, imagery draped over it. So you can see its ice core and soil going down the sides. And it's hard to tell what scale that is. It could be a lot bigger than it really is. Uh, another feature that's important in um, uh, glacial studies and frozen ground studies like this are, you can see this poly polygonal ground here. These are, are uh, features that are expanding in some areas with um, a warming climate. So studying what those things are like and, and where they are and how they're expanding and changing over time is important. Um, one of the more interesting things that uh, we did up here was these are areas where you have tens of thousands of what they call thermokarst lakes. So you think of, of karst as being a place where you dissolve um, carbonate and create caves and caverns and stuff, sinkholes, stuff like that. Well, here it's, it's the uh, melting of the ice that creates um, the karst features. So here's one of those right here. This is a, a thermokarst lake. And with the uh, green laser, we can actually penetrate the water and get an idea what the bottom of that lake looks like without having to take a boat out there, or sonar, or something like that. Great, perfect. So uh, you can see some nice uh, sedimentary structures here in the bottom of this lake. Um, you know, direction of, of uh, water flow has been from southwest to northeast here, and you can see where the water gets deeper and shallower and all that. So that was. Uh, much better resolution than you could ever get from, from uh, taking a boat out there. So next. So I'll finish with um, uh, a reminder of, of you know, these, these very critical first two things and make sure before you do a remote sensing or a, or a, uh, a geophysics study that you, the person who's doing the study fully understands what the target is, what's, uh, what's the problem or issue that needs to be solved. And then finally, when they're done, you know, take that map and make them tell you, uh, work with you at least to uh, translate it from uh, you know, the geophysics realm back into the real world. And, and you'll get a lot more out of the geophysics than you would otherwise. So thanks. That's it. Great, no questions. I'm off. Yeah. So uh, I've been asking them a lot of these kind of questions, but I, I'm interested in like the, the business side of things. So sure. Like, who, who pays you? Are you a consultant um, to solve problems, or do you get funded by government agencies to go out and do your ladder surveying, or how, how are you able to do your work? So um, I mentioned earlier that the um, the Bureau of Economic Geology is a research unit at the University of Texas. So we have a combination of funds. Uh, some of it comes directly from, from the legislature to support kind of the basic activities that go on. And the, the rest of it comes from um, grants and contracts that we get from various people who want surveys like this done. So uh, lots of federal funding, federal projects, lots of, most of our work is probably for other state agencies. So. Most of our coastal work is funded by the General Land Office because they're the stewards of the, the coastal lands of Texas. Um, uh, the salinity studies, uh, those were funded by TCEQ because uh, it was an environmental issue of um, contamination of groundwater from, from uh, uh, oil and gas production. Uh, the Railroad Commission has funded studies. They, they're the ones who funded the uh, groundwater exploration out in West Texas because the, actually, it was GLO who did that one. Um, they are stewards of the Texas public lands, and that land is a lot more valuable if they can find groundwater under it than it would be otherwise. So, so, uh, so yeah, just a whole variety of, of uh, sources like that. Yeah, I'll just comment. It, it, you know, compared to the other presentations we've had from people at the Bureau, mm -hmm. it seems like your work is much more 
physical boots on the ground. Yeah. Labor. Yeah. You know, like like what consultants do, like whatever. Right. Versus just kind of background research in the lab. Right. So I didn't know. If yeah, we, we've. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I like about it, and that's, I mean, that's one reason I've been here 40 years, because every project is different, and, and you get to go out, and you get to see cool places and interesting things and, and do things that other people don't really get a chance to do. So it's not quite as, as directly applicable as the consulting realm, but it's, it's kind of in that intermediate uh, area of, of applied research. And so it's, it's very gratifying to uh, do things that matter to people. So, yeah. So maybe as a segue into the next talk, I'll mention that um, you know, there are two conferences I usually go to every year, either AGU for the more academic side of what we do, American Geophysical Union, or the uh, SAJEEP conference for the more practical side of it. That's SAJEEP stands for Symposium on the Application of Geophysics to Engineering and Environmental Problems. So, so the, going to that conference, uh, the the clientele or the attendees there are completely different. At AGU in San Francisco or wherever, you see mostly academics, and it's nice to talk to those people. But at Sajeep, it's always consultants and uh, you know people who are uh, really applying these geophysical methods to very specific problems. And and one of the most successful uh, recent uh, geophysical consulting companies is is Collier Geophysics, based in Stephenville. And and your next speaker is actually. Uh, going to give you an example of, a, of an application of a, of a uh, uh, geophysical method for um, finding you know, the kind of stuff that you're talking about. So uh, they're much more focused on individual issues than, than we are, but um, very similar approaches. Yeah, Arden. There's a hatch in the bottom. It uses, uh, that instrument uses a standard aerial photography port. And we use, for Texas surveys anyway, we use a, a text op plane that's been specifically modified for that. So it's a little Cessna 206. And we put that box in there, and, and it uh, fires the lasers out directly out the bottom. And it does it in kind of a circular pattern. So as you're flying over the ground, you're getting these, uh, you know, helical uh, patterns of, of uh, returns from the ground surface. So the, we fly at about 400 meters height, and uh, you get a swath width about that, that, uh, that distance. Oh, that was all the ground-based instruments. So uh, that would have been a, a good introductory slide. But uh, we can go back to that real quick. Oh, that's uh, going forward, I think.